So I also went and bought chessface.com and chessface live. These are just dumb moves. I can't believe I bought chessface.com. Okay, can we just can we just cut that from this video that I thought at one point that was a domain name <laughs> worth owning. Hello everyone, I'm Sam Copeland and I'm the VP of content here at chess.com. In this video, we are celebrating 100 million members on chess.com. Thank you so much to everyone who has been playing and enjoying chess on chess.com or anywhere else. To mark this milestone, we are doing a Q&A on the history of chess.com with CEO Eric Alabest and Chief Chess Officer Danny Rich. Hey everyone, thanks for being here. Hey everybody, and like Sam said, thank you to everyone for being here. For this Q&A, we posted a call for questions to the community on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, and more. Now, we received hundreds of questions back and we sorted them into a sort of chronological order to line up with developments at chess.com. Danny and Eric have had no time to prepare answers. They'll just be winging it and we hope that you enjoy the conversation. First off, we should start with your own history. This question is for both of you, but we'll start with Eric. Before chess.com, could you give us a brief summary of your history, both in and out of the chess space? What was your working and educational experience and your aspirations and dreams before chess.com came into the picture? Oh man, okay, <laughs> as quickly as I can condense that. Um, I learned chess when I was eight. My mom loves to tell the story that she taught me the rules and then I beat her every game after. It's probably mom lore, that is maybe not true, but I always loved chess, but not, not so much until uh, senior year of high school, uh, some friends and I just kind of randomly started playing more and my grandpa had a set and I just kind of got into it then. And then freshman year of college, I was playing in my dorm room and this guy walked by and he was like, oh, I want next game. And he totally crushed me. And then it turns out he was the chess club president. And then we became friends. And well, you got to tell him why Jay challenged Okay, you. Jay challenged me because I just teased him a little bit in the bathroom because he was brushing his teeth for a really long time. And I was like, and I'd never met him before. And I just kind of snarkily said, like, dude, is your dad like a dentist or something? Like, <laughs> why are you just brushing your <laughs> Anyway, so he kind of like was like, who's this guy who's teasing me I've never met? And then so then when he had his opportunity to like, he came in and just wrecked me. I don't even remember the game. Okay, I probably, Jay's version of that story is I'm brushing my teeth and here comes this guy who thinks he's better than everyone at chess and he's like talking trash. Like, yo, is your dad a dentist? And I'm like, I'm going to beat that guy. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, go ahead. He, he, he beat me. I, I probably played H4 and then like Rook H3. <laughs> and anyway, yeah, he beat me bad. And, and so anyway, I kind of fell down the rabbit hole. I like literally like the next day I went and well, I started like paying him for lessons. And then I went to like the bookstore and bought a book called Weapons of Chess. It was my first book. And I just like, I just fell down the rabbit hole and I fell in love with it. I subsequently started a chess teaching business in elementary schools where I would, where I wrote a curriculum and I hired instructors and I would get kids excited for chess and they would go do that. And we ended up doing chess in like a hundred schools. And this is while I was going to college. So I had a lot of kids, I had a lot of other students working for me teaching chess in schools. That kind of led to this opportunity where I was like, man, I'm like buying a lot of chess sets and there's a lot of interest in chess. Maybe I can get a discount if I buy them from China. And so I started buying and importing chess equipment from China uh, uh, where it was manufactured and, and from India. And I started a website called Wholesale Chess where we were selling chess equipment online. This is long before Amazon was like selling everything. And I did the, the, the teaching business and then I did the e-commerce business. And then while I was doing the e-commerce business, I was like, oh, this is getting really tough to like pay for ads and compete. And I was like, oh, I really want to do a chess community because then people will come for the community, but they'll also buy some stuff. So it'll work as like a self-sustaining business model. Plus as a chess fan, like where's my home? Like I wanted the MySpace of chess uh, <laughs> that will date me a lot. Shout out to you, Tom. That's right. Tom from MySpace. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm condensing this story a little bit, but I was, um, I was in business school and I ended up buying the domain name chess.com out of bankruptcy um, for $56,000. So we started building like the MySpace of chess. We were building a chess community. It was doing it with Jay, the guy who kicked my butt in uh, freshman year. And that's kind of how chess.com got born at the very beginning. And that's kind of my interest in chess was like as a business, as an e-commerce, as a fan, as a community member, as someone who was playing on other sites 
like Yahoo Chess and stuff and was very unhappy with it. I wanted a place that felt like home for me. And that's my relationship with chess and chess.com in a nutshell. I think I'd heard part of that story before, but I had no idea that you bought the domain name while you were still uh, studying and while still in business school. I assumed it was a venture after that. It was actually right before I went to business school. And then while I was there, I was like building out like wireframes and kind of designing out what I wanted and then started you working on it. the first. Yeah, I was designing the logo and designing what it would be and like how you would create your profile. And it looked a lot like MySpace, but it was chess. So that's what I was doing. And then Jay, my co-founder, uh, one of our co-founders, he was starting to code on it and do different things. And then you know, I was in business school and, you know, my friends were off going, getting jobs, in different places and doing all these things. And I'm like, ah, I'm like, I'm just going to launch this chess thing and see how it goes. And then maybe I'll go get the, you know, take the job offer at Facebook or Google or YouTube or all these other places where I had opportunities to go work. But we launched it and, you know, started going. And every couple of months I was like, oh, am I going to keep doing this? Or am I going to go to back, you know, get a, get a J-O-B? Um, and I never, never did. So one thing that maybe some people think, because you're not nearly as public as Danny is in terms of, you know, Danny's on shows and is speaking more oftenly about, uh, more often about his history with, uh, chess.com and so forth. I think some people maybe don't know obviously that story, but for some who know a little bit about it, I think, you know, maybe they think that chess.com is an outgrowth first and foremost of business school and some, you know, opportunities and the Silicon Valley culture. And really what your story kind of tells everyone is this is really starting with chess. You know, also like the um, story with wholesale chess, I think, is something I connect with because I've been using wholesale chess for a long time Before and really, cool. really enjoyed just, you know, how much more affordable wholesale chess was. And I think a lot of people in the U.S. also um, who are organizers may not even know that that was an initial venture. Um, and so you've been, before chess.com, you know, someone who's really moved a lot within the chess world. Uh, and I think many, many people will appreciate that, uh, that additional insight. Yeah, I will say this. I didn't start chess.com. It started as an idea for customer acquisition for wholesale chess, like community, because we couldn't, we were fighting on Google ads with like other things and chess sets. You're paying $3 for someone to click on a link for chess sets. And then you were selling a $3 chess set. Like the math was not working out. And at the same time, social media, you know, was, was uh, you know, communities were, were, you know, spawning like all sorts of different you know, communities online. And I was like, okay, this is kind of the future of where we're going with things, you know, Chess needs its online community. It doesn't have one. Like Yahoo Chess is not a community. It's a place to go like have a bad experience and get cheated against. <laughs> and then there were other places, but they were all pay to play and you had to download. And it was like, it didn't feel like a community to me. And so I wanted to do that. And, and so I was like, okay, we'll build the community. People will come and then they'll buy some chess. Well, anyway, I sold the wholesale chess company to, to uh, you know, another great company uh, and, and, you know, they, they've done great things with it. And, and, you know, I continue to be a fan. Um, but then I kind of focused in on doing the community part, which was nice because I didn't have to worry about the building in the e-commerce sales angle. We just can focus on just doing the community part. But, but you mentioned like the Silicon Valley thing. Yeah, I was in Silicon Valley. It was like the heyday of like things going on. And all my friends were like going and getting jobs or they were like out there raising venture capital money. And I'm like, hey, I've got this chess idea. And like, I'm going into like venture capital firms and they're like, uh, chess is way too small to be investable. And so I literally have a list of, of investors, including some who still I'm friends with, who are like, ah, I missed my chance. But like, everybody said no. Except your friend's mom. Except my friend's mom. Shout out to friend's mom. Yeah, she, she was like, I'll loan you money, but I don't want to invest. And I was like, okay, I'll take the loan. Because <laughs> we, you know, we had to pay. pay She's like, pay. I don't want equity no. in, in, your, in your ridiculous chess situation. Yeah. But just pay me back my 70 grand in a few months and we'll be good. Yeah, yeah. It was actually after <laughs> three years. And okay. I paid her back like 100 grand after. Th anyway, it, that, those were the details of our first uh, loan. But the thing is, is that not having venture investment, and not being able to run the Silicon Valley like playbook 
made us do everything different. First of all, it didn't feel like a business because we didn't have like a, a starting, we didn't know exactly what was going to happen. We had some ideas around building a community first and then would come play. And then maybe we'd do lessons and different things. And then maybe eventually, I, I didn't totally know. But what I did know is that it cost money to do this. We couldn't afford a place for people to work. I couldn't afford to hire people in Silicon Valley. So what did we do in basically 2006? We started a totally remote, totally global company where we hired from our fans and people who were already coming in and using the site. So Jay and I basically built the whole site together, the two of us, with Igor on the back end. And then this guy named Piotr came in and built, like, started building the play server. This guy named Matias from Argentina, Piotr from Poland, and Matias from Argentina. He was building a chessboard. And this community member who was in the forums were like, hey, does someone want a job? And this guy named Matt was like, hey, I'll do customer service. And he's still here. And that's kind of how we started. It was like a minimal burn that I was paying out of pocket and from this loan from my friend's mom. And we, we were just like working literally till like 3 a.m. every day, just like working, working, building, building. And it was very small. And we, so we built a sustainable business where we weren't like just spending tons and tons of money. We were doing it in a sustainable way and just out of like passion and with the group, the totally distributed thing. And now like that was not how people did businesses, but like, you know, fast forward 15 years, you see a lot more of these bootstrapped, remote, internationally grown companies. And we were like at the very beginning of all that. And so now that's becoming a playbook out of Silicon Valley, but it was certainly not at the time. And my classmates and maybe my wife thought we were crazy for doing this. And it, you know, long, long term, as some people say, it was, it was an overnight success 15 years in the making. So, Danny, uh, you know, obviously we've kind of pushed quite a, uh, a bit down the road of the development of chess.com, but your story, obviously, you know, some people are familiar with, especially people who've been around in the US chess scene are familiar with elements in terms of like your development as a prodigy, you know, being one of the leading uh, talents in the US. But I think there's a lot that people don't know and a lot of people don't know about your uh, involvement in chess teaching and chess coaching and chess websites before chess.com. Could you describe how, you know, you were in chess and eventually you connected with Eric? Yeah. Um, like you said, Sam, I've, uh, I guess I've touched more on my, my, a little bit of my story before than, than Eric has. We won't get into I'm not going to get into to anything uh, pre pre chess pre chess businesses at this time. You know, my 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 early childhood years of learning chess and getting into the game are, are its own complicated wild ride. But when I did get into chess, I was uh, pursuing it as hard as I could as a young talent traveling the world and playing chess. And at some point, uh, that that came to an end due to some health issues and some opportunities at the time. And um, I went full steam into chess business, similar to Eric, a little bit different in terms of getting in there with, with the idea of wholesale chess. But I was, I was a purchaser of wholesale chess items as, as someone running an LLC um, that was teaching in the schools and, and doing things where I'm from in Arizona. But at some point, the internet happened, right? And everyone remembers where they were when they got their first link to YouTube. Or if you don't remember where you were exactly, you remember being like, wait, what? There's like, there's like videos on the internet. And I think that for me, as someone who had been, you know, grinding and, and doing the, the typical chess player gambit, speaking to all my, my, my brethren, my, my sisterhood out there of chess professionals, right? You're teaching in the schools, hoping that that leads to private lessons, hoping that leads to group sessions, running tournaments, and you're scaling, you know, the opportunity that is to build a chess business that is super awesome and serves a, a community. And I was doing that. For, for many, for I say many years, really from the age of 16 to the age of 22, 23. So very young, I, I started doing this. But then the internet happened and I was, I was super convinced and focused that the, that was the future. And I had this crazy personal dream at the age of 22, which was I was going to start the first chess website. But really the key to us was we were going to do live chess coaching. And to me at the time, that meant integrating with WebEx, remember WebEx and oh. go to mypc.com those things, right? So I was focused on having a chess website that could scale what I knew how to do, what I was doing, which was teaching and educating, right? And making a video because I thought that this would be a way to not just grow the community, but obviously grow a business and a, and a livelihood for my family. 
So I bought a, I, I, I actually taught myself the whole Google AdWords course myself in bed, just like watching these videos. Oh, that's what SEO means. I didn't even know what that stands for. Okay, great. Here's what a keyword is, right? So I started teaching myself how the internet worked. And I was like, okay, well, obviously I should own chess.com because clearly that's the most powerful brand. I learned that you can build a brand on words that people don't know, but really the key to where the internet is going. And at this time, the ICANN, like the for the, uh, that's the that's the international governing body, if you will, of the value of internet domains for those who don't speak ICANN. And I was like, they didn't even really understand the chess market, right? So I was like, I'll go buy chess.com. So I go to chess.com and I remember seeing it at this time, it was still pre even Eric and Jay because it was the chess mentor website, the guys that owned it, that Eric, as he said, bought it out of bankruptcy auction for. So I was like, okay, well, I can't get chess.com. What else is available? So I went and I went to GoDaddy and actually, no, it, I went to um, one of the earliest ones before GoDaddy. GoDaddy is too modern. It was one of the earliest ones you buy domains from. And I bought chesscoaching.com. But at this time, I'm, I'm a couple years behind Eric, so I'm not thinking about the MySpace. I was already thinking of Facebook. So I also went and bought chessface.com and chessface live. These are just dumb. Movies. I can't believe I bought chessface.com. Okay, can we, just, <laughs> can we just cut that from this video that I thought at one point that was a domain name <laughs> worth owning? I don't even know if Eric knows that. So I bought chessface.com. I also bought chesscoachlive.com. So I was, I was like in this, like, I'm going to gather these things. And I started spending money I didn't have Taking, taking out loans and debt while my wife also thought I was crazy. Let's just say that personal struggles were being combined with having an idea and I think an intuitive sense of this is where it was headed, but no knowledge or ability to execute on this dream, right? We're, we're kind of, they ended up combining in hindsight at the perfect amount of serendipitous where when someone falls totally on their face, they recognize the opportunity that's before them. And so I was trying to do this chess face live that was a, a thing in my head, <laughs> which, which chesscoaching.com was probably the best domain I owned, combined with running my in-person business, while also still thinking I was going to become one of the top players in the U.S., competing at the um, East Bay International in 2007, 2008, winter of 2008 into 2009. And I had just finished, I had a very good tournament. I got what at the time was my fifth I am norm. So I had already made the title, but it was kind of catching up. Um, and uh, have a great tournament and in walk these two guys at the end of the tournament right before the the post event dinner wearing chess.com polos and it, little did i know they would be my future my future business partners um and i would force my way into being as close as i could be to being a co-founder because immediately as jay and eric will both tell you that dinner was a lot of Danny doing Danny things and then being like, who the, is this guy? Is he ever going to shut up? Like, this is obnoxious. Anyway, so that was kind of how our relationship started. And, um, and I was way over the top. I was so excited. I guess to my credit, I understood through my own education, it was like you learning just enough about electricity to think you can change an outlet in electrocuting yourself. I had learned just enough about the internet to knew what needed to be done without having any of Eric's skills or, or his background or knowledge of where to drive SEO and how to actually build and run and manage a web company or Jay's ability to code it, right? What I had was about, at this time, $40,000 in debt of this website that would I would eventually just walk away from. And a marriage that was being barely held together because I was 22 and, and life was complicated. And these two guys I met at the very earliest of stages, because even though it was founded in, in 2007, I think Eric would say like, it hadn't become what it was going to become, right? And so at this time, they were kind of like, all right, there's an opportunity here. What does the professional community bring us? And do we want to expand into content and, and, to, and to seeing what videos and articles and those things could do? And, um, and it kind of serendipitously came together like this within one year. I would be walking away. And my, my, my career at chess.com started um, like everybody else with um, getting, uh, getting, getting PayPal'd uh, uh, some money here and there when I wrote a mentor course or did a video. And, but I learned something very quickly. Like I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed the opportunity that was creating videos and creating content on the web. And I think I was good at it. And it became a self-fulfilling thing. But then I was in that weird moment where every ounce of energy I put into chess.com that I needed to get paid for because I was broke. I was a broke ass, you know, whatever with my, with my wife, we we're barely making it was also taking away from this investment I had been making for the last year and a half that was obviously never going to get off the ground. That's a really hard thing to kind of swallow. You know what I mean? Where at some point 
I had to make the, you know, the very tough choice, which was, hey, I needed to go full time here. And lucky I was dealing with very generous co-founders who treated me like I wa was one of them from the beginning. And I was able to get in on the ground level and, and do what, what we could to shape this thing. So I'm, I'm going to save, again, like Eric, a lot of the other rated R details, but that was what happened. I was uh, put in a pr super lucky spot. Also, shout out to David Pruis. He oh, yeah. brought me in. David, David Pruis was someone who I was close with because I was at the tournament in the East Bay and, and David and I were both there. And David while I was, I, I had a business I was running and I was in a different spot as far as what I needed. David was in the ground level two with Eric and Jay as far as content goes. And to David's credit, no matter how crazy I was thinking I was going to start my own business, he never gave up on me and continued to pull me in when Eric and Jay were like, all right, well, this guy's crazy, right? But it kept having me do content and eventually helped create the opportunity as we were the original co-directors of content yeah. for, for chess.com. And um and whatever it would become. But by the way, eventually, um, Eric bought chesscoaching.com from me for, I think, like 2,000 bucks, like several years. It, it, which a is bailout. A, ba a bailout, for, a favor <laughs> to me. Like, hey, man, I could use a little bit of cash. Like, you know, he's like, All right, you know we don't need this, right? So today, if you go to chesscoaching.com, you are forwarded to chess.com slash coaches. And that was my domain Thank you, <laughs> but Thank you for those uh, organically searching for chesscoaching.com. Anyway, I, I, I don't think I'm missing any... Can, can I say one moments. thing here? That yeah, I, I really hadn't put this together, but as I heard you talking about how and why you started your businesses, and you, you know, and you said, "Oh, all the chess professionals out there who you know are expert or master yep. or higher who are thinking about businesses and they're running regional operations of coaching and you know doing yep. these things." What I realized when you were talking is part of the reason I approached Chess.com the way I did was because I wasn't that good at chess. I'm not that good. I'm maybe 1800 level and I wasn't good enough to do those approaches. I, of course, I didn't think about coaching. I mean, sure, little kids in elementary schools, but yeah. I wasn't the one to go take chess forward. At the same time, I understood the game well enough as a fan to be able to appreciate the game, to understand that world. But I, had, I, I graduated from being beginners. So I think I was in that like almost perfect storm area of like, good enough at chess, but not too good at chess to see the community need. And I yeah. could see, I was in the middle of the spectrum, so I could see the full spectrum. I could see, oh, this is the yeah. professional thing, but I'm also really connected to being a beginner. And that was, I, that just kind of hit me as to, no, why, I think it's as super to why that worked. I was in that spot to see the whole picture. And frankly, if, if this is okay to say, that's partly why when all the other chess companies out there at the time, and there were more than there are now um, back then, they all had logos of, you know, kings or they had knights or whatever. And we were like, we're doing the pawn. And the reason we're doing the pawn is because we're doing chess for everyone. We're not doing chess just for professionals. We're not doing chess like just for beginners. But we're doing chess for everyone, starting with the pawns and on up. And that's why... You know, people are like, well, that's not, the, that's not the strongest piece. It's not the most commanding piece. And I'm like, no, but it's the piece of everyone. It's yeah. the piece of everybody. And that's why we started that way. So anyway, it just kind of was putting that together that I think I was at the perfect spot rating-wise and chess understanding-wise to make this happen. And maybe it would have gone a totally different direction if I had been weaker or stronger or whatever. Anyway, so that's great. Just a little thinking out loud here. I think that's, you know, incredible. And I think one of the things that people might also kind of pick up on is, you know, how even at that early stage, kind of your different experiences complement, right? And chess.com is so many things, like we're a huge website with a lot of product and stuff that serves people who are just getting into chess, but also big events and live streams and things like that. So even like way before chess.com was really coming into being, like you were already thinking in ways that would kind of develop into spheres that you would really lead on in chess.com and really in the whole chess world. I mean, we'll talk about some other developments later on, but a lot of the initiatives, you know, first done on chess.com. Um, there's obviously other movers in the chess world. I don't want to undercut that, but, you know, your experience has really set things up at an early stage. Um, we've actually addressed a bunch of the questions that the community raised right off the bat. But one question I did want to bring up is I think really surfaced by two people. One is Peter Doggers, obviously a really important staff member. I should get my pronunciation correct. Peter Dockers. Uh, like as if you're wearing Dockers, yep. Dockers pants. Yes. Yes. He worked really hard to make sure my pronunciation was uh, strong the first time we met at the meetup. And then he hasn't cared since because no one can uh, uh, follow through and the company's growing too fast for him to keep everyone his own point as uh, 
he kept me initially, and uh, Maedros from the YouTube community. And they both ask a very similar question. Basically, when you looked at uh, like ICC and Play Chess, who were kind of leaders at the time, and you also mentioned Yahoo Chess, um, what was it that you saw as kind of an opportunity and a way that you could set yourself apart? And I think it would be interesting maybe to broaden that a little bit and think about like, you know, at the time the, the website is uh, coming into being, there's a lot of evolution in the internet, right? There's kind of a previous generation of website and then a generation after that. And so when you looked at what the landscape was, what was it that you saw as a way that you could go and, and really develop things and, you know, be chess.com? I was into chess. I, you know, I'd played some over the board tournaments. Um, I haven't played a ton. I've maybe played in, you know, in, in a handful. And, but playing online wasn't a fun experience for me. And I know a lot of people are like, well, I played on ICC or I played on play chess. It was great. But like, I wasn't a chess professional. And some of it felt too fast. Some of it felt like, oh, you got to know like console commands to like start a game or challenge someone. It just didn't feel like inviting. It felt like a gated thing that you had to like climb over a wall to get into. You had to download it. And maybe you were like at the library, at, you know, at the university. And like, it was just kind of hard to do. At the same time, the web was changing. Like JavaScript was a thing and like, Oh, interesting. Real time was a thing. It wasn't just HTML page, click a link, new page, click a link, new page. There was like interactivity and stuff. And, you know, Yahoo was there with its like Java applets. But even then people are like, oh, Java's dying. And then Flash was kind of around. But even Flash, we could kind of tell back then was like, you don't want to mix like Flash, the other stuff. And anyway, so there was these kind of new technologies that were happening as again, as a fan, I, I sat in the right spot. I wasn't a beginner who was kind of happy with Yahoo, but I wasn't an advanced, you know, titled player who was like, what's wrong with ICC? It's fine. I was like in the middle, like, ah, these don't, you know, it was like Papa Bear's too, you know, bed is too hard and mom's is too soft and, you know, or been, you know, whatever, just right. There was no just right. There was no, you know, too hot, too cold, just right. Couldn't find that. And there was other stuff on the internet you know, there was like super cool blogs and there was like great news sites and there were bloggers and, you know, there was chess content. It was emerging and there was, you know, free internet chess server fix. I played, I actually played most online on fix because for some reason it just felt a little easier for me. Um, and I did play some, some, some Yahoo and there were some other communities starting to come out, um, at, at the time. And I was like, ah, oh. I actually tried to partner with some of those communities that were newer and were developing, uh, at, at the time. And they were like, nah, nah, we don't see any value. And like, I literally have an email from one of those communities that was like, ah, oh, we don't really see any value in the chess.com domain name. I'm like, oh, okay. All right. So I guess we're going to do this on our own and we're not going to partner up with them. Um, so I was like, all right, Jay, let's do this. Like, let's build our own thing and, and do it. Um, but, you know, it, this is not a knock on what anyone else was doing. This was not, a, this is not a knock at all. Like it was working really well for some people. But again, for me, where I sat, what I wanted, you know, the temperature of porridge I wanted in this story did not exist. And I wanted something that felt just right at home. And that's what drove me to build what I wanted as a chess fan. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting because I, I, I agree with whatever you said. And I would actually say that I had my own sort of like not just right story, despite obviously having a place to play chess with, with, with great players. Um, and both ICC and play chess in their own different ways were getting that job done, right? Um, but as someone who looked at the chess world also very differently, partly because I, I wasn't a young child prodigy anymore who didn't have to worry about earning a living or making enough money or, or uh, supporting a young family that whether he should have started that young or not. It's just, just going to turn to dysfunctional expose of whether I should have had kids at the age of 20. Never mind. Um, just kidding. Um, but no, I looked at the chess world very differently because as a player, pure player, we can't even talk about from the tech perspective, but even just as like, if all you care about is playing great games, there was an opportunity there. But if you were looking to grow and reach more of an audience. I looked at ICC and play chess similarly in terms of what wasn't there, which was content yeah. and community. It wasn't, there wasn't really an organized home that gave chess professionals a voice. 
and an opportunity to to not just be to be um, compensated for bringing value to the community. And everyone remembers our OG OGEist of video authors, you know, and your Roman Jinji Hashvili and Melikachian and um, you know so many. Uh, so I can name I name a whole whole bunch, but. It wasn't. It wasn't just that those lessons were bringing in a new way to 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 make money as a chess professional, but they were growing who you were to a massive audience, right? And we, I was getting communication very early on, not just as someone who was doing videos if people liked your videos, but like from like Melik being like, "Hey, like I have so many people who want to do lessons with me because we're reaching so many people," and that was also something that didn't exist in in a in a single location. So similarly, like I was looking to grow a. I was looking to grow a business maybe a lot earlier than some people are thinking that way and combine that with the fact that the timing was happening where the internet was like, there was just a ripe opportunity to like jump in and invest in, invest in content. And what's funny is to wrap a ribbon on partly what the tipping point was for me too, back to the story where David and I were working super closely together. The one thing I, I was always wanting to do is even in the early stages, there was a place to play. We were doing videos, video on demand content, you know, and, and we had articles um, and, and even the chess mentor lessons. But the one thing I was still thinking about doing on my own, the last like trump card I had that I was going to do my own website for was this thing I was do I was going to do, which was the chess live stuff. And I remember the phone call where David called me and he's like, Danny, like we're crushing it. I know you've got this other site and I've been talking to you about really fully committing, but I think I have the thing that would make you want to be even more full time. And he's like, we're calling it chess TV. And this will be live interaction stuff. And we'll start with, we'll go over the members games live. We'll call it like member analysis. And then we can do other things. We can even do shows, right? And we can do shows like where we just like talk about chess, right? You know, or, and this was exactly like what my vision was for chess face live, which, so again, I just to wrap around that story. It was like, I was simultaneously like, you're right. Like I would be, I would, I would love this and I would own this. And also this was like the final nail in the coffin, like just fully commit to chess.com being the place. So I just wanted to wrap a ribbon on this story because I only just remembered that just now when we were talking about it. Well, but it yeah. wasn't too long after that either, that when we were doing this chess TV thing and we were putting out different shows and back then it was working on there were like different technologies like livestream.com, yeah. like Justin TV. We were yep. long yep. before Twitch. Um, yep. And it wasn't that long before, I don't remember whose idea it was, but I do remember literally taking a thousand dollars cash, which at the time felt this was a totally insane thing. Thousand dollars cash and dumping it on a table in between Danny and David, who had laptops, and they were going to play a match against each other for a thousand dollars cash, like split in a certain way. That was the first the, death the match of the speeches. That was the birth of the speeches championship yeah. and all that has become from that. And that I remember that moment. And again, that was a brainchild between between you know David and Danny. Um, and because that was it. Like we wanted to do interesting stuff for people to watch, yeah. and we wanted to you know for fans. All this stuff was for fans. Fans, you know, fans like they were, they wanted to watch that. Fans like me, where I wanted to watch awesome players competing for prizes. And, you know, here we are just doing the, the CGC, the, the chess.com global championship with a million dollars in prizes recently. That is crazy because I remember, literally remember dumping the cash onto the table of a thousand dollars like it was yesterday. And then it was just a million dollars. Yep. Anyway. It's a mind trip. We should have done that for the CGC too. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> bring in a briefcase and just lift it up. <laughs> we really, we could have done something like that. We we yeah. do a lot of meme, a lot of meme good content, and I think that's like part of the fun thing. Like back to it is even though, again, I I because of where I came from, like David, like I brought what was what what I was asked to bring, which was you know a view from the professional community and not just the the views of what professionals you know, thought about our, our site in terms of how it compared to ICC, right? I remember that the early years of our struggle when frankly, it wasn't even our fault that we were lacking innovative ideas, but browser technology just hadn't quite caught up to what the downloadable desktop application can do, right? And there were, there were many things we were trying to do to innovate what was the core experience of playing chess online, let alone giving lessons online or consuming content online with, you know, everything and where we've driven things. But I just remember that we were bringing that, but also we brought, like I said, back to the business mentality, we bought this, brought this idea of what did our students want? What did people want who weren't professionals in terms of what made the game interesting and engaging, right? And 
I think that that was how we always approach content was making it more accessible and more fun. And on, okay, on, I'm glad you said that because at the time, and, and I know there's a bunch of questions and we'll get to that, but it's like bringing up all these memories. It's like at the time there, I, I, as a fan, again, I wasn't someone, I wasn't someone who was, you know, 1975 rated trying to go to 2200. That wasn't me. And so there was a lot of co chess content that frankly, just yes. didn't reach me. I yeah. didn't care. I wasn't trying to go, you know, 30 moves deep in the Alapin. I didn't care. And my ideas for videos, and if you go back in chess archives, you will find this. My ideas for videos was around humor. Like you said, Mimi and humor. Humor has been at the core of this. There's the very first and one of the only pieces of content I ever did at chess.com was this video where we set this up where I started, um, I was with David and we were on camera together for a second and then he like pretends to leave and then I start analyzing my own chess game on my own, which is like, you know, I'm a bad player, you know, I'm not bad, you know, 1600 or whatever, like I'm trying to analyze my own game. We had planned it that David would come back in the room and be like, oh, I forgot my car keys. And he'd be like, are you analyzing your game on your own? And it'd be like, we had this like stupid cringy setup of like me trying to analyze and then and then we started with humor, but then I was doing the analysis, but he was kind of like analyzing my analysis. And so it was like, it wasn't, you know, GM imbuing knowledge from the top on everyone. It was me as a struggling intermediate player trying to improve with this like kind of helping comedic kind of, you know, figure helping me along. So again, this was just a very different approach that we were taking to the game um, with humor with a recognition of where we were as improving players. And it was different from what was already out there being sold as, you know, 22 DVD sets of, you know, opening theory. It was like quick and it was fun and it was interesting and it was humorous. It was just different. Yeah, it's totally true. And that's that, I would say that that's the spirit of that lives on in every everything yeah. that we do, right? And it's it's funny because at the core of the game is like, the, at the core of the game is is that we're all trying to get better with this, with this constant existential acknowledgement that we will never truly master the game and we will maybe yeah. like never even break through these like artificial barriers we've yeah. set. And it's funny because I think that, I mean, you look at our site, like everything about our, our site and our product, like puzzles are designed to improve your tactical yeah. rec pattern recognition. Game reviews designed to help you improve, you know, learning from your mistakes. But at the same time, there's an acknowledgement that I think is, is key to enjoying the experience, right? Yeah. Embracing the labor is just as important as the goal at the end of it, right? And I think that, I think that I, I've said this many times, and I said it early on in the stages, is that it it took non-chess players and struggling chess players to make a great chess company. It didn't take an international master, and it didn't take just people from the traditional chess world. There's nothing wrong with that, and I would say that there's been a, a lot of value brought by everyone's perspectives, but I think really at the core of, of what what always drove us is like, hey, we're not going to pull this thing into a world where... Yes, we acknowledge we're all here because we want to get better at chess, but enjoying the process is gonna, is what's going to keep us around. That remains why we do what we do. Yeah, you know. And I, I want to say one other thing is like we've thought about this and, and the journey of a chess player. And in typically in the past, a journey of a chess player has been oh your journey toward mastery or you know your journey from a beginner to a thing. But I have a different definition of what the journey of a, of, a, of a chess player is. First, you like kind of get interested, then you learn the rules. And then you like play chess. That's okay. I play chess. At some point you transition to I'm a chess player, which is different from I play chess. You self-identify I'm a chess player. But instead of the next step from chess player being chess master, I like it being chess fan because then you enjoy the game at any level. Whether you're rated 400 or 1400 or 2400, you can enjoy and appreciate the game. And that's the journey that chess.com is trying to help you on. Now, does that mean your chess might be getting better? Yeah, sure. That's great if that's your goal. But it could also be that you just love the memes. You could love the characters. You could love the personalities. You could love the articles. Just become a fan of the game because the game has so much to offer beyond just my rating is going up or going down. Mm -hmm. So anyway, just a little bit of, of how we viewed it differently. Totally agree. And I'll, again, wrap up. There's... So you, you outlined it. It's chess interested. Yep. We'll call it chess aware or chess knows chess. Chess aware, plays chess, identifies as I'm a chess player, and then like 
chess fan, yeah. right? And there's one step even before all of it, which I think at the core of, of this sort of journey we've all been on over the last couple of years is, is what I, I call chess curious. Yeah. There's so many people who actually know of chess. They literally know it as a concept. They recognize it when they see it and like, but they're not curious yet. And a lot of what we've tried to do with our content, with our attitude, with just like the culture of our company is take people from like, it's there, I know what it is, but it's just like the thing that Ronaldo and Messi set up on a set that Louis Vuitton wants to sell for $25,000, right? But actually, like, I'm curious about that. I want to be curious. So before we can even get them into interested and learning and then saying that they play and then becoming a chess player, I think that we've seen that chess is, is, is something that a lot of people are curious about. And I think before you would see it and recognize it almost objectifyingly be like, but that's not for me. Because I know what that represents. That represents yeah. something that's hard, might make me not feel smart, right? And we've shown that that's really not the case, right? I think that chess does have the ability to improve people's critical thinking and all the cognitive development research. And, it, you know, it's, you can be a smarter person if you play chess. I genuinely believe that. But also, like, chess is not for smart people. Chess is for everyone. And I think that that was at the core of what we were sort of trying to hammer on, especially now that we look back and we're like, oh, we, we kind of, we beat this thing into a into a mold of a beautifully shaped pawn, but that's what we were beating in, 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 into the mold. You know, this it's analogy like, is losing itself. From the very beginning, though, and you just reminded me of something. From the very beginning, Chess.com was a place to capture that chess curiosity from the very beginning, because inherently, going if you go back, you know, twenty years in the internet, there when you would go to your browser search bar, there was no search; it was just a browser bar, and if you typed chess in there and hit enter, there was no Google search at that time doing that. It would just put the .com on there and take you there. And so chess.com captured the chess curiosity of the world long before the search engine was even built into the bar. It was just chess, enter, add the .com, go. And there were thousands of people each day showing that level of curiosity and arriving at chess.com and then starting to see like, oh my gosh, there's a community here. Oh, there's some articles written by this guy, Danny. Oh, I can be, create a profile. But from the very beginning, chess.com has been the receptacle of, you know, of, of the, the funnel of like curiosity and then bringing you on in to show you the awesomeness that is chess and helping you become a chess fan. You know, I remember that was from the very beginning. When we tracked our admin, admin pages daily, I remember the first time we crossed 5,000 new members a day. Yeah. And it was like awesome. Like, Amazing. We thought yeah, that's not a that's not a subtle flex, everyone, but just like facts for chess fans watching this video, you're here because you love the game. Like right now, we're getting more than a hundred thousand new members a day. Yeah. And it's like, totally and, and and literally we have wondered at some point. I, I'm being totally honest here. There have been times, you know, you're going along in this business for years, years and years, you know, 10 years into this business, and I'm seeing like you know, 5,000 people a day. Okay, we hit 8,000. What, we hit 10,000? Oh my gosh, 20,000 people registered today. I literally was for years afraid that at some point, the last person on earth that had been interested in chess <laughs> would have registered. And then the next day there was, that was it guys. The, like the, the last flat, interest, flat earthers out there. The <laughs> last interested person on earth has registered and now we're done. Yeah. But somehow through all the like, all that is and all the crazy tailwinds we've had, not only is the last person not registered, but there are more. And it's, it's so anyway, yeah, we're doing 100,000, right? It, it, it's just mind blowing. And I'm so grateful to the community. I'm so grateful for the world to continue to, to push forward the benefits of the game because there's so many, whether it's getting smarter or whether it's having more fun or whether it's just being part of a group of people that are interested in what you are. I'm just grateful for the game, and I'm grateful that, that, that people who are looking for it can find a home just like we envisioned. Speaking about uh, the growth of members on the site, we have a very simple question from Matt Chow on Facebook, and he just asked, who was the first Grandmaster and or Super Grandmaster that you remember joining the site? Oh, that was the... I don't know that, so I'm I'm sorry to say I'm not sure we have an we easy answer to that. Really but I do remember the first time Magnus played on our site. I remember that feeling, and I remember the goosebumps going on my arms of like, oh my goodness, that's like yeah. okay. I, I mean, know. there's no better chess player in the world who's gonna ever play. Well, maybe in the future one day, but that was like the thing. Like, oh my gosh. 
you know, I think where we sit now, I think in, in many ways it might um, look to some like this was a foregone conclusion um, that chess.com would be in a spot to 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 be the the global leader in chess, you know, in, in the chess world. And I would, you know, there's a long story there that I would argue is actually not necessarily the case. And I think especially because, you know, nobody owns chess. It's the original open source game and always forever should be, right? And the goal of the game is is that there will always be other chess sites coming up. There's always going to be new people recognizing a different way to learn, a different way to approach and play. And we understood that. And I think that there was, I remember, I, can, I can't say this, Sam, I remember early on that there was like an NM, um, Jerry at Chess Network, shout out to Jerry, was like one of the first regular presences in the online chess community yep. who made chess.com his home. Yep. But way back in the day, uh, Jerry. And I remember Jerry and... You know, a, a couple of the the earliest F. It was all FMs and NMs That's besides right. me right. and David. That's besides right. me and David, me and David were the first like because international all the, masters. All the IMs and GMs were, were just were playing on ICC, chess and so it. without telling that whole sort of disruption story, I would argue, you know, there was a lot of thought into what we recognized as things that we wanted to do more for them, um, and I think that. I think we ultimately delivered on that. And I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, go down too much of the details because it's a very long story and I, I don't mean it with any sort of disparaging. I mean, ICC is, is frankly like still great as, as a great place to play chess. But I think what we, um, what we looked at was there was an opportunity to do more for professionals. And we were doing initially um, in the same way we do it now. Like, you know, it's a bit of a lost leader for us because we recognize them as super important people for the culture of the game globally. We recognize them as influencers that are motivating people tomorrow to keep playing chess, to push through the tough tournament, right? To actually want to get better. And if you want to get better, um, then, then you know, we, we, we offer a lot of ways to do that. So, but I would say that I don't remember who the first GM was, which is crazy because me and David probably literally recruited this person yep. at some point because it was just NMs and FMs and then like Danny and David. And I, I can tell you that the, the, the domino, the domino was Hikaru. The yep. domino was Hikaru because at some point, and Eric gets full credit. I don't even know if Hikaru knows this story. So at some point we were, we were running what was called the Chess.com Ambassador Program. Shout out to Jan Ludwig Hammer, Sam Shanklin, Eric Hansen, John Bartholomew, you know, some of these early, early friendships that I had developed in the chess community that I was convincing to give this little chess website that could a chance because I know ICC is better to play, but give us a chance. And we started getting them playing on our site and it was going well. And I think we were offering a lot of benefits. But when we thought about trying to get someone to play on our site who could who could motivate other title players to come, we were having a lot of internal debates about all the top players at the time. And not, I mean, I've known Hikaru since I was 11 and he was nine, right? It was, we were, everyone was good. There was no pros. Or, I'm not going to list any of the cons, but Eric was the one who was like, hey, like, if we're going to do this, why not just go right to the top? Like, Hikaru's the best online chess player in the world. Let's just go get Hikaru. Cause I, in my brain, was like, first of all, like, let's, uh, you know, we, we had all the other grandmasters, Bruno, but it's like, hey, if we really care about this, why are we spending our time? Um, you know, trying to trying to do this in five years. Let's just go get Hikaru to play on our site. And and Eric reached out to Hikaru and had a great call. And I've known Hikaru for years, so it wasn't hard for me to connect with him. And and the moment we got Hikaru playing on our site, it was like every top chess player in the world followed. That's true. We've kind of covered, I would say, the founding uh, for Chess.com through kind of the early years, maybe through 2010-ish. Uh, correct me at any point if the years kind of don't line up. So we've kind of passed through chess.com's childhood at this point. We're in more of an adolescent stage, one might say. So chess.com is successful. You know, there's members, I mean, um, but there's still a but... ton of really important challenges that need to be solved to grow and scale. Right. So we got a lot of questions from members kind of about, you know, those technical challenges and how things developed and, uh, and grew from here. So one question is from T Sayer on Twitter. And he says, what was the first kind of roadblock for chess.com? Like a problem with functionality or challenges in terms of growing the user base, the first big hurdle that you felt you really had to overcome to, uh, to grow the company and to be successful. Well, wow. <laughs> Jay's not here to defend himself. <laughs> um, but <laughs> let me say this, that Jay is an amazing engineer and a brilliant dude. And the two of us just like single-handedly built the first chess.com, 
which literally was like an English major in undergraduate uh, making CSS, and Jay single-handedly like building this, you know, PHP MySQL site. In his attic. In his attic. Way past normal human hours. And developing, you know, pages that were designed to, and databases that were designed for like a certain scale. The way that databases were back then, like the relational databases, it wasn't like no SQL and a lot of things now, but like all these relational database stuff and like, you know, you'd call this thing and it would look at this table and reference this thing. And like, when you get enough people, you, you just couldn't do that. And I, I'll tell you, like, there's been a handful of moments where I was like, chess.com is not going to make it. And there was a period of time where we went, and, and to all of you who were there at that time, and your patience with us as we fumbled through the, v, the scalability. V2, V3? Not that part. Before okay. that. Okay. The, like, the scalability of just, like, trying to load a page when more users... And we were adding more complexity. And frankly, we didn't have the tools. Like Jay was like, my SQL isn't scaling. I don't know. And we were like reaching out to consultants for like, oh, there's like Memcache D and there's like, you know, all these different consulting firms trying to help us like scale our database. That happened like pretty early on. And I had some terror of like, I don't know if we're going to make it. And like, all right, you know, Igor was in there. All right, we got to put Nginx in front of all this stuff. And Jay's like, I think I got Memcached D working. And like, it, it look, it was just a bunch of like kids teaching ourselves, like, what do we do here? Like today, technology, take it for granted. So many problems that existed in 2010 you know, and 2012, you know, those things have been solved like a hundred times over by like awesome communities and awesome people building stuff. That's great, but it was not the case necessarily back then. So there were some very early technical challenges that I felt we were never going to overcome. In fact, one of them, and I don't know if anybody remembers this, but we were like, look, we built on the wrong thing and we need to move our games from like one table to a different table and like change our game table in MySQL. And Jay's like, I think it's going to take like half a day. I'm like, uh, all right. Um, and he's like, no, the site's going to be down for half a day. I'm like, how is that possible? He's like, no, we're just going to be down. Like, we have to move this stuff. I'm like, all right, I posted a message to the community. You guys are going to be down for half a day. I'm so sorry. This was like way long ago. Posted it. It was a day. It was like, so, so, you know, four hours go by. I'm like, all right, Jay, like, how are we looking? He's like, it's going way slower than I thought. I'm like, oh, how much slower? He's like, this might be a day. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I can't. We're going to be down a whole day? No way. This is, we're going to die. One day turned into two days. Turned into three days, turned into four days. Just.com was down for four days at the very beginning. I'm like, that's it. Like, we should just close down. We should, like, no one's going to ever come back. We're going to turn the site back on. Everyone's like, oh, Just.com never came back online. That was one of the most terrifying, you know, you can imagine. I literally was like awake every, every hour for four days, wondering when we were coming back on. So anyway, funny, funny story. Um, what year was that? I don't remember exactly, but very, very early on. So that's about a super early challenge. That's one. And since then, we've had a lot of like hairy moments of like, you know, scaling technology. Look, we're hitting 100 million members, you know, and there's like millions of people visiting every day. There are technical challenges that you don't see until you get to the next thing, whether it's a database here or a query there or a number of sockets or number, you know, all sorts of different things. And we're tripping these things all the time. And probably from the community on the outside, they're like, gosh, chess.com, get your, get your shit together. And it's like, yeah, we, we, we're learning as we go. Like we're just chess fans trying to figure this stuff out. Um, so apologies, but also thank you to all of you who've, who've been through us through some really tough um, times as we grow. We got a lot of questions about another technical ish challenge uh, that naturally had to be dealt with, which would obviously be fair play. You mentioned already the challenge of like Yahoo chess and you said you would log on and you know, you'd just be facing cheaters regularly. Obviously also chess.com is kind of developing at the same time as chess engines and, and mobile, right? So it used to be like, you'd have a complex like Fritz or something that not everyone have. And then everyone has an engine on their phone, right? super, super easy to do. So like when you kind of launched, like you couldn't have had any cheat at the time. How did you kind of build that and see that challenge developing and, and expand that over time? It, it's a great question. And it's funny. I almost answered this like two questions ago. 
Because when you said, who was the first super strong player to join chess.com? I remember the moment where I was like, oh my gosh, we have a grandmaster on our site. He's like kicking everyone's ass. He's like, he's just winning all of his games. What super strong grandmaster is this? I remember his avatar and everything. I'm like, what secret GM is destroying everyone? <laughs> It was not a secret it was not a secret. ending. <laughs> it was somebody cheating. And we're like, oh my gosh, how are we going to deal with this? I mean, it's hard to explain the whole process, but immediately right then, we're like, this is going to be make or break for our future. We have to invest here. And immediately started hiring like a statistician before Roland, who is who's been with us for a super long time and doing this, we had somebody else who was helping and they were matching up, you know, engine moves and doing different things. And then we, we, we uh, you know, built an amazing team around this and we've invested so much time and money and resources just to protect this game that we love. Um, but, you know, I, we immediately knew how dangerous this could be. And, and remember that very first cheater, it was such a painful experience to see. Um, so it's been at the core of what we've done and it's challenging because it's not preventable. And that's the, that's the hardest thing. And, and if there's one, one sadness I have, it's that we can't, we can't prevent people from doing that. We can't stop somebody from opening their browser and pulling out their phone at the same time. Like we just, you can't stop it. You can only catch it after. And so there is some damage and loss as you go through. And I, I apologize to the community because I know the feeling. I've been cheated against. I know that feeling. It doesn't feel good. It feels a little better when you, you know, get the after the fact, hey, you were right. But like, it doesn't feel good. And unfortunately, it's not preventable. And, that, and that's the biggest bummer. But we try to catch it as quickly as we can. Keep, keep going. I'm going to close my Discord. This is hilarious. Hi, Discord. Keep going. <laughs> Yeah, I think that answered the question really well. Just a lot of members were interested, like basically how do you go from zero to actually having, you know, really robust anti-cheat? It's constantly going to be an issue, but I think that was something that a lot of people were really interested in. There is a very long story as well. I'll add my own, my own, my own side of that. I'll say that it also goes the way it did in history because of, because of the way we dealt with those different cross crossroad moments, right? And also probably because of the community demand. I mean, mentioned Roland, shout out to Gerard, the cheesy kid, oh, our first yeah. ever kind of self-proclaimed like, hey, I'm going to be a cheat detective and I'm going to do everything I can to help you guys catch cheaters because he hated them personally with a, with a, with a passion <laughs> um, and, and still does. And of course, now we have a massive fair play team and everyone who does, does a ton. A lot of people don't know Robert Hess, uh, along with the many hats he wears. He's probably the world's leading expert cheat detective. Like, honestly, like Robert Hess has a grandmaster and you don't even know that. But I'll, I'll say this, that Eric is right that we did, um, we did know we had to act. And it was also partly because of the broader discussions that were going on about the narrative of our company in terms of, you know, David and I having the goal of increasing the amount of professionals using on our, using our site, which would increase the amount of players interested in using our site because they, you want to be where people who are better than you are playing chess. This is the case in every sport, right? You use, you use Nikes because Jordan said he wears them, right? I mean, we, we were, I was invested in growing the reputation of, of our site. And, and in addition to the play experience itself, as we were investing in in browser technology and getting faster and better, we were really on the level with ICC. The only other narrative was, Hey, you guys are playing with Yahoo chess numbers, you know, so we've got a million members, but you've got ICC standards. And they don't even have a single member playing unless you're paying. Hey, that rhymed, right? So it was a different standard with a different number. And we were in a tough spot. Like we couldn't keep up with the amount of new members a day, the amount of opportunities for cheating. And, you know, there was a very, very faithful. I remember where I was standing in my kitchen at the time when I was on a conference call with Eric, Jay, and David. And we were having a meeting, just the four of us. And there was a discussion being had about what we were going to do about this. And the, the scary reality that this was going to take massive investment, much more than we were currently making. And I remember, and I, I've shared this story before, that just the fact that we said this out loud, I think all of us threw up in the back of our throats a little bit because of our love of chess coming first before being a tech company or a gaming company. We are not a mobile game shop, never have been. We are not just a tech company. We are not 
a product company even necessarily. We are all those things, but at the core, we're a chess company. And, and I remember us four of us being like saying out loud, can we deal with this? Like, or are we just going to have to say like that we can't stop it? Do we have to face our community and say we can't stop it? And just saying that was like, yeah. like we have to do something. And I think within less than a year, like Roland was hired. And I, I think we we immediately started investing in the technology that would go on to power what is the best cheat detection system in the world, as as has been endorsed many times by many people. And that is what we have. And it, it, it was born out of, frankly, it was born out of necessity. It was born out of crisis because our ability to grow as a company, to improve our reputation and to invest in what would become the future ecosystem of events, which allowed the future ecosystem of streaming and content. It's based on people wanting to follow and 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 understand and get entertained by chess that matters. And you can't have chess that matters if at the core of that product, it's it's it doesn't have any integrity. The chess doesn't matter if it's cheating. And so really, I would argue in some ways, like what we did with Fair Play has been existential to our business. It has been existential to the future, uh, to what was at the time and what is now the past, the future of the chess community online. Mm -hmm. And without it, like you don't see what you have now. You don't see any of, of what matters online happening without the core of fair play being kind of the thing that powers the integrity of the product. And, and so. Um, and I just want to say one other, th one other thing on that. It, it's really, it's, it's hard and it's sad and it's challenging because. What we've come to realize, well, first of all, a lot of people at the beginning just didn't think we could catch cheating. They didn't, they didn't know and they didn't think we could. And like I just remember the first time like we closed a grand, you know, a grandmaster or a title player. It was like really hard to do because we're like, I, we have the conviction to do this, but like this is like a, a person who like loves chess. And what we came to realize, and this is this is hard, as much as we hate cheating and as much of a bummer as it is, like sometimes the people who cheat at chess are some of the ones who love chess the most. And that was one of the hardest things to reconcile. We had to both protect the community, but also like, oh man, these are also like chess fans, but they're like hurting the community, but they're part of the community. Anyway, it's, it's, been, it's, it's been one of the challenges. And, and frankly, I, I wish it weren't possible. It would, it, we, we could take all of that time and money and resources we have to put into protecting the game. And if we could have put all that into like teaching the game, imagine where game review would be today if we took all the cheat detection stuff and put all that effort into the game review. But like, we couldn't do that because it was existential. One of the things that uh, we touched on in this conversation is the next thing that a lot of people had questions about, um, including um, someone who's got a long username on YouTube that seems to be entirely in binary, uh, and Walter Bick, um, who is producing a lot of Chess.com's events, and Daniel Lona on Twitter. And what they're asking about is, um, you know, what was kind of the process like when we first decided to do money tournaments, you know, things like Title Tuesday and other stuff like that. Obviously, that ties into fair play a bit. And then also um, from Bic, you know, on the broadcast side, you know, what was the decision like to start broadcasting this and other, uh, other kinds of events as well? They're kind of related, right? Um, and it, it, it's dominoes that fall because our goal was to, was to provide opportunities for professionals born out of, out of, you know, the story. We now kind of understand a little bit of the lineage of that and um, and then also improve our reputation as being a site for chess professionals, not just a site for uh, doing what chess.com is ultimately, I think, here to do, which is to grow, grow the game, but also serve the community. And like, you know, Sam, you know this, we talk about it all the time. When we give our mission statements to what we do. It's to grow and serve. And sometimes the service is, is, is more of the focus than the growth. And sometimes we're more focused on the growth and this, right? So I think that process of launching money tournaments would put into the service department at first. It was, hey, like we're going to provide this service for professionals online, money tournaments that have never existed consistently. Shout out to ICC, who was running the Dos Hermanas. The Two Sisters tournament was the only annual prize money event online for many years. And we were like, why don't we do this? You know, every week. And it, I, I don't, I literally don't remember whose idea initially Title Tuesday was. It was all of our ideas, but it was like, we're going to launch a regular money tournament. It just happened to fall on Tuesday. I think, you know, we do cringy things from time to time. Title Tuesday sounded cringy enough, so let's go. But because we had that tournament, we had a bit of a reason, a hook, if you will, for Hikaru to play. And if Hikaru's playing, other people are going to play. And okay, now they're all mad at us about cheaters. Well, let's hire someone else to focus on cheating. And now we're doing an even better job. So let's invest even more. And, and it becomes a self-fulfilling kind of prophecy. And then over time, 
what we learned was that just you know I, I don't think it's I don't think it's hard to to anticipate the the direction of where broadcasting would go for chess as 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 uh, Bick was saying because look at look at every other industry right what do we have around the world is right now the World Cup is going on and people stop to watch these games because the best players in the world at a game we love are all together in one place right and it's the same for every single sport and so you know the difference was that we were able to do it on a much more regular basis i think than had existed before um and and you know we also let's say if if starting events were were born out of the service part of what what is chess.com's mission statement to grow and serve the chess community and to make it fun all the things but i when i talk about like the chess and the content part of our organizations to grow and to serve at some point what we saw with events was that on the flip side the biggest events were also on the growth part of things was what we saw was in the biggest moments, chess tournaments were our opportunity to grow the user base, in particular the world championship, right? The world championship was an event that transcended normal interest in the game. And we saw it at first in 2010. I remember where I was in my basement when we covered the first world championship we ever did on chess.com, which was 2010, Kromnik to Paulov. I covered it with David. And we saw a bump that November of like, oh, like membership went up. We were getting 8,000 new members a day instead of 5,000. And then the next, and then when a non-plate, I remember we were getting like 13,000 new members a day. And 8,000 of them were directly attributed to India. And it was like, shout out to you, Vishy. And then it was, and so we started to see that events done right were not just a service to the chess community because we always knew they were kind of a money loser, um, and, but they were great for entertainment, made us all love the game. But they also were bringing in new interested chess enthusiasts. And so I think that it, it just became its own self-fulfilling thing. And over time, we naturally became a chess events company because of that process. What did I miss? I, I think the one interesting thing is you know, that that's all right until this point, now December 2022. But yeah. I think what's going to be so interesting is like, this is a longer timeline and this is going to go. And like people maybe 10 years from now are going to look at back and be like, oh my gosh, like, Chess wasn't even on TV yet in 2022. Yeah. But like, yeah. so that's where we're thinking is like, okay, like the distribution of chess and fans, like, you know, FIFA's out there. F1 is out there, like American football. There's like all these things out there that have, you know, all, all these fans who love to watch. But if you think about it, how many people drive race cars? Like not very many. How many people like play soccer? Okay, a lot do. But how many play American football? Almost nobody, but they all watch it. Well, it's crazy because chess is like one of the most played games in the world and has a small viewership in comparison to that versus something else. And so we think that like the number of people who will want to watch chess in the future, we yeah. think it's going to grow a lot. But, you know, I guess we'll watch this in 10 years and see how right we are. But it, this is just a moment in time. And, and we do think this is going to keep going. This next question is uh, uh, from Greg Dutra on Twitter. He says 12 year old account here. So we got uh, someone who's a bit of an OG. And he says, you've almost always focused on the mobile aspect of the game. When did the number of mobile users surpass browser-based users? And he says he assumes that that's happened by now. And he has a side note that I don't even get that says, bring back the map. I would love to choose opponent based on location. Ah, very interesting. Uh, first of all, I don't remember when it crossed over, uh, but we, it is about two-thirds mobile and one-third web. But people who play on web are playing a little bit longer. Um, and, you know, again, some people are playing at work and maybe it's in their background and doing different things like that. Um, but, you know, I, I do remember the first time when, you know, I had an iPhone and I was like, oh, I guess, you know, chess is going to be here on the iPhone. And, you know, I was trying to figure that stuff out. But I, you never you never really see everything in the future, how it's going to how it's going to pan out. Mm -hmm. But, you know, yeah, it exploded. I mean, phones are everything. Phones killed cameras, you know. It's just our lives are, are revolve around phones in so many ways. Um, so it, I don't know exactly when that flipped, but we did see it pretty early and say this is going to be an important part of what we do. And what I love is there's a lot of, like, cross-users. People, you know, they're on their phone when, at this time, and they're doing puzzles here. Or Some people tell me, oh, I only do this activity on this thing. Me personally, like, I, I only play really on my phone but I enjoy a lot of other things on, on, on web. So it, it's an interesting um, dynamic there. Um, yeah. And in terms of the map, for the, the someone who was there very early on, we had so few members at the very beginning, we're like, hey, we'll just like map all the people who are online right now. 
uh, which works when it's like a few hundred, maybe even a few thousand people. And we were using this like Google free API to create a map. You like load in all these things and then, you know, all these different dots on the map based on their, you know, location. And the, you can create a map and you can click on them and see their profile and challenge them. Like that really works when you're, you know, at a few hundred, maybe even a thousand people. But, you know, when you're five million people uh, playing every day and you've got a million people online at once, you, you can't really do the map. And Google started charging for that API and the page became completely unresponsive at some point. We're like, look, this is going to be an impossible thing to do. Um, but good shout out from, from the past. OG. Thank you to Greg for that one. So the next thing that we have a lot of questions about is kind of in the boom and, uh, you know, 2020 onward, which we'll get to. But a place where we didn't really get a lot of questions, but was something you mentioned before we started recording, Eric, that I'd like to touch on was the period before that. And you mentioned kind of 2016 to 2018, where we really dealt with a lot of challenges, a lot of technical hurdles. And I think the community was aware of some things, but a lot of it's happening behind the scenes. So they don't have kind of the same insight that you do. And that's maybe a really important part of the story of chess.com. Could you share some of the extreme challenges from that period and why you consider that to be one of the most difficult uh, periods at chess.com? Yeah, it was super tough. And again, like Jay's not here to defend himself on some of this and, and tell his side of the story, but you know, we built a site and we'd rebuilt the site and we'd kind of massage the site and we've done different things. And we were working inside of a, a framework. If you want to go Google, it was called Qcodo of all things. Like, you know, it's, it's a long relic of the past of a framework and a PHP and stuff. And we, and we got to the point where it was like, we just couldn't do this anymore. Like there was no more extending of what was going on here. We were at the ed, end of it. And if we didn't start rewriting this, and doing it, then we were never going to have a future. We were just going to be stuck there. And so you've got this car going, you know, going around the racetrack and you're like, all right, there's no pit stops allowed and you need to rebuild your car. And so while we're like doing things, we've got people trying to rebuild and you've got to be careful and do this. And so we were kind of rebuilding the entire site while it was still being maintained and doing things. And the challenges you have there is like, you can't stop. And so the, the changes you make aren't perfect while you're going. And so you end up just doing it, but then doing it again. And, and then you fix something else and then it makes you redo it. And so we got into this like absolute technical hell where not only was it like problematic, but anything we were like, oh, let's add this really cool thing. Let's do this awesome idea. If you did it, you just have to redo it again in the future. So why do it? So we had this period of absolute like, super frustration of because we didn't feel like we were serving the community we didn't feel like we were serving our mission because we were held back technically it, it was just a very hard and dark time because we just felt like we couldn't improve it wasn't great how it was we couldn't add anything new there were, they were just dark years and we tried to focus on some content and we were doing some other different things but like and our team was by the way was working super hard no no disparagement to them but the, the, the challenge they had to rebuild this car as it was going around the track was massive. It just took longer, frankly, as all projects do. Instead of saying it was going to take six months, we should have said it was going to take two months because you have to multiply it by five. Um, so, you know, you just, it just gets longer. The longer you say it's going to take, the longer it took. And so it was just many years of that. But what is really awesome is eventually... In 2018, we finished this long, dark period of refactoring and we relaunched the code and went through all of our betas and we had a new look to the site called V3, which many people hated, but it came along at the same time. And obviously everyone's used to it now and we're on to like other versions beyond that, but we relaunched, we had a new look and some people have embraced it and some were mad about it, but at least we were on a new platform we could build on. And not long after that, we started churning out new cool stuff. Some of you may remember when Puzzle Rush launched. It blew the chess world up. And it happened literally right in time for the World Chess Championship in 2018. So the World Chess Champion, as Danny, Danny mentioned, like, you know, more people are looking at chess than ever in 2018. And we freaking launched Puzzle Rush right then on our new platform. And all those pieces just came together of like, and it was just awesome to see the chess community embrace. And it was like, well, of course, it was excited. It was a new feature, which we hadn't done in years. And it was a really good one. And we're like, oh, 
We, we did it. We like, that's it. We like grew chess. We're done. Like, how cool is that? We, we will, <laughs> I remember the word saying like, guys, like after it came down early, early 2019, like we all need to reset. Let's think about how we're going to add more features. What could maybe be something close to Puzzle Rush again? Because we are never going to see growth like that for chess again. In 2018, <laughs> Puzzle Rush. Because the other thing that serendipitously went was the World Championship. Our first feature in three years. God, I get anxiety. I know. It was our first feature. Like the dark, Those were the dark years that Eric and I joke about. Because Eric, Jay, me, everyone everyone who was there at, at the time, like, there were tears during that time. It was hard. Like we, we, anyway, so it was, it was tough. But then like, here comes Puzzle Rush. Here comes the World Championship. And here comes a fateful dinner where I had Queenie's. Shout out to you, Hikaru. Take me to that small restaurant, the Isle of Man, the British Isles, because Hikaru picks it. Because Hikaru's a bit of a foodie, for those who don't know. Um, and he's like, they got these things, Queenie's, like little like, you know, clams with bacon on them. Anyway, they're delicious. And that was the dinner where I told Hikaru that I thought he could be the ninja of chess and that Maybe if he gave streaming a chance, he might be surprised. I spent two and a half hours explaining what was the online content ecosystem to Hikaru and Sunil. That was, so when we 2018, the Mile of Man was like end of September, October, or maybe in October. The point is we had a month and a half and Hikaru embraces streaming partly because Puzzle Rush was such a fun feature to stream. So like product delivers, you know, in, in several years, like the sort of, not the... I don't want to say the tipping point because there were so many incredible streamers who were committing to what would become the future of what we now know is like this incredible ecosystem online. The chess bras were like the OGs of, of, of committing to it, you know, um, at least as far as having a fully, a fully focused Twitch brand, right? And there were there were so many others, but but we all knew, and Eric Hansen and I had talked a lot at the time, like we knew like the category needed a Hikaru, and we knew that it was gonna be something that was gonna take us to the next level. But I think partly the reason Hikaru committed is because it was so easy and fun because of Puzzle Rush. Yeah. Like, that was it. it. And then the World Championship viewers, we were raiding the chess bras and Hikaru every single day with, with peak viewership for the chess category. And it was like, holy shit, like, this is awesome. And, and so that was it. The chess world peaked yeah, at peaked. the end of 2018. Yeah. That, was, that was what you asked about, right? We're talking, if that's all we're talking about. That was about, it. Right? That, was the, that was the high point of chess. That was it. So next question. <laughs> I, I'm going to kind of step back just a little bit because I wasn't sure where to put this question in, but I really wanted to get it in. Uh, this is from David Casas on Facebook, and I think we had some others who asked a similar question. But who are the de developers who've been really important uh, here at chess.com. Obviously, there are so many. Um, it's impossible to mention everyone, but could you highlight some of the people who've been here for a really long time? That's kind of an unfair question because if I mention one and I don't mention all, that might hurt hurt some feelings and stuff. And I don't, I don't want to say that, but I will say, you know, I, I did mention kind of our four starting folks, which was Jay co-founding and, and Igor, first sysadmin and still with us and growing everything. And Piotr, who started on our live server and Matthias, who did our chessboard. But since then, the, the people that we've added in, I, I can start on names, but then I won't stop. But then I'll stop too short. The number of people and how we built that from the community of posting on chess.com and saying, hey, we're trying to hire. We need an iOS developer. Hey, you know, I, you know, hey, that's interesting. Hey, he's not in our time zone, but let's try to make it work. Or you know, we need this thing. And we've had so many amazing developers and so many who have stuck with us. Some people don't know this, but like our retention of people long term at our company, I would put our company retention literally up against any company out there. Like the number of people who and how long they've been here and stuck with us, I would put that up against anyone because it, it's been such a cool and fertile ground. And if you're a chess fan or if you're an engineer or if you're you know, someone who just wants to work at a great place, like once you get in here, you just almost nobody leaves. Um, anyway, we've had tremendous talent come through and, and we are stronger than ever. And the platform that we're building on now is faster, quicker, better, more resilient. And yet we're still reinventing it. And we have all these things we're doing for the next version. We're actually in a little bit of a lull period right now because we're in we're we're building on the next future foundation of what chess is and what that scalability looks like and what that database looks like and where what that like server infrastructure looks like we're in that period building for the next generation and then the brilliancy that there is in the engineering team to do that i'd, I'd put them up against anybody it's amazing and he does know 
probably 90% of the names. He, but I, I agree, it's hard to name because like the moment we start, yeah. I mean, I, I, it's just, yeah, it's just like, you know, but anyway, go ahead. Sorry, Sam. Maybe we should also mention that our About Us page is probably never quite fully complete. Uh, it takes time to keep everyone up to date, but it's a great place to go and see like how the teams are built, get to know some of the team members, especially like if you're working in a sector and you're like, who's doing that over at chess.com? The About Us page, uh, you know, Google it, you'll find it. It's a good place to get some perspective. So speaking of the success that was born out of those practices and philosophies, and this question is from Eric Pappas, who's on staff. Um, what was the point where you said, this is really taking off big time? Was there a moment you remember where it was like, you know, this is going someplace that we wouldn't have predicted, you know, a year ago or two years ago? Well, I mean, Danny, Danny mentioned, we first thought that we had experienced the chess boom that had washed over us in 2019. 2018, 2018. At the end of 2018, yep. kind of going into 2019, we kind of looked at, oh, well, that was, guys, that was the chess boom. And oh, we're at a new level. We, we peaked. It was kind of then, but then like literally like COVID happened. And then we were, we were ramping up so quickly in each country that locked down Italy, India, but you could see the registrations flying through as each country locked down. And it was all happening so fast. There was no like, oh, this is so cool. This was like, oh my gosh, we're going like, to, uh, yeah, yeah. We, we <laughs> literally couldn't keep up. And so there was no like positive coolness out of this. It wasn't until like we were into the, you know, pandemic and then like several months and we're like, oh, wow, this, okay, well, during the pandemic, more people are going to play chess. It will die back down. Nope. Then came Pog Champs and what Dean talked about. And we're like, oh my gosh. Then, okay, after that, it will, nope. Okay. And then came Queen's Gambit. We're like, all right, well, that was definitely the peak. And then, and then the media started writing about chess. And then, okay, where is it going to stop? We, we have been... And it, then Pog just, Champs 3. You're just getting hit wave yeah. after wave after wave. And then there's the stuff in the media now, which is like wave and like... We almost can't even come up breath fast enough to recognize this before we, there's like another wave coming. And so from this point on, we just don't know what to expect. Is there yeah. another is there another wave coming? Probably. Again, we're looking at the blip in the timeline in 2022. You know, 20, 2032, maybe we're looking back and going, oh my goodness, they only had 5 million, you know, daily or 6 million daily users like wow, there are 20, you know, there's 25 million people playing chess every day. There's 50 million people playing chess every day on chess.com. No, no idea. And I think there's a lot of reasons to believe that that could happen. And we won't get into all of them now, but I mean, it is, you know, and I think all we've done at those times to answer your question, Sam, was, you know, you, you experience the boost and you're, you're grateful for it. You kind of ask yourself, how did that happen? What can we learn and try to do again? But ultimately we've done what we've done, which is, during the down periods, we slightly contract, focus on what we can control. We invest where we where we where we know how to invest, and we grow, and then and we serve, and then we start growing again because of something that happened, right? And I think that I always say that like there's a, there's a healthy part of acknowledging that there are certain things you know you got to do and be stable and invest and be smart about, and you can't always be swinging for the fences or you strike out. Right. So I think that we recognize that um, there's uh, there's been some incredible growth. So to answer your question, like when did we know? I mean, I, you know, I think that part of being the mission driven company who didn't really have a lot of thoughts about what success would look like would tell you that in 2018, I knew that this was what we were doing for life. And this was this was as good as it was going to get. And as Eric you know, said at the meet of that year, it was like, look around you 75 people, because this is as big as this company's going to get, you know, <laughs> and then, you know, next year. And so we, we almost sit at 450 people now for those who don't get the joke. Um, right. It's been three, three or four years. Ah, that's like mind blowing. Right. Yeah. So I think I think there's a healthy part of acknowledging that you don't know what you don't know. We know what we're going to we know that we have a very long list of things we want to do to serve the community. We have we have a lot of exciting ideas about leverage that we think we are controlling currently, that if we catch lightning in the bottle again, maybe it won't be as, as accidental or random as, as we know it was. Maybe to the outside world, it'll look that way, but maybe it won't be. And we're trying to invest in those ways and be smart and look for ways to kind of just continue to grow the audience. But I, I think um, because when you're a mission-driven company who is, is very kind of like little chess engine that could, we thought the same level of success that we had in 2018 was awesome as we do now. Yeah. And, and maybe like Eric said, in 2032, we'll be like, wow, 
that was kind of silly to think that the Queen's Gambit was a big deal. Anyway, so who knows? Thank you so much, Eric and Danny, for sharing your personal stories and the story of chess.com. Uh, thanks also to all of the members who submitted questions, the ones we were able to get to today, the ones we weren't as well. Uh, thanks to everyone as well who's playing and loving chess every day, whether over the board, on chess.com, on any other site. You all make the chess community incredible. And uh, for my part, I can say that it's just amazing to work at a site that continues to serve this community. Thank you, Sam, and thank you, community. Bye, everybody.